Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking. Today we are talking about the top 10 most effective medieval weapons. But how do you assess the effectiveness of a weapon? That there isn't one absolute weapon that excels all other in all combat situations. There are weapons that work better against opponents with no armor, weapons that work best against armored opponents, weapons that are designed for one-on-one -on -one single duel, while other weapons are more effective in formation combat. So in order for this list to make sense, I've decided to consider the following scenario. It is a one-on-one -on one duel to death you don't know what weapon your opponent is going to use and you don't know whether he is in armor or if he's not wearing anything at all so the weapons that are more versatile will score higher on this list whereas very specialized weapons that only work well in one specific of these will be penalized now in order for this list to make sense i've decided to consider three main characteristics Effectiveness against unarmored, which will be represented with a red circle. Effectiveness against armored, represented with a blue circle. And range, represented with a green circle. Weapons that will score well in all three circles will make the top list. Number 10 the mace. Well, the mace isn't necessarily a medieval weapon, meaning that it's probably been around as a concept or a general design since man appeared on this planet. But the flanged maces or the circle ones, those that are typical in the Middle Ages are the sort of mace that we are considering now. The mace was a very effective weapon against plate armor. So if you were to fight an enemy or a foe in full plate or even full mail, then yes, mace would probably score super high on this list. But since this is a list of versatility Utility. The mace is only number 10 because it's not as good against a person who does not have armor. Given, if you hit them very well with a very well placed strike in the center of their forehead, yes, you're going to break their skull and you're going to win. But it's not as easy for a blunt implement to deal incapacitating damage to an opponent as it is for bladed implements. So the reason for that is that maces concentrate the force over a very small area. Another problem with the mace is the fact that they have no hand protection. And in this hypothetical duel that we are considering, you're not allowed to use shield. You have to rely on your weapon for both offense and defense. So a mace is problematic. It will be very difficult to protect yourself, not only because there is no hand protection, but also because the majority of the weight of the weapon is at the top. It's a top heavy weapon, so not as nimble. Reach of a mace, not particularly good. Now, before moving to the next weapon, I'd like to take a few moments of your time to show you one thing that you might have already noticed. This amazing bronze ring. Now, since we're talking about weapons, we're talking about metals, and of course, there is a lot of steel in this video, but there is also some bronze. Now, I personally really love bronze, so I was really thrilled to be able to get this bronze ring. These two bronze rings were sent to me by Viking Jewelry. And if you like Viking things and you like jewelry in general, well, now is the time to go check out their site because you can get a 30% discount on all the rings with the code META. 30. This 30% 30 discount will be valid for 48 hours from the release of this video. You will find a link in the description below. Okay, so big thanks to the guys at Viking for sending this amazing bronze ring and I am sure that you will find good rings that you can use the code that they provided for you to get your discount. And now let's get back to the list. And number nine, we've got the Warhammer, specialized blunt weapon that was very popular in the late Middle Ages when you had to deal with, again, knights in full plate armor that were basically invulnerable to any sort of cut. The same reasons that we have considered for the mace apply to the Warhammer. The only reason why I gave a higher placement in the list of the Warhammer is because, I don't know about you, but I would feel more threatened from a Warhammer than I would be from a mace. Maybe psychological, not really sure, but it's also the fact that he has two ends and you can use both so you can punch a wound you can with the back end or you can smash someone with the front it does have a little more versatility warhammer very similar reach to a mace again hand protection unfortunately and generally speaking defense not particularly good at it and number eight we have got the axe now, the axe is interesting because it's an in-between a sword and a mace, meaning that, yes, it's top-heavy, more similarly to a mace, but it cuts. So, from that point of view, it's more similar to a sword. It's an in-between, and that's why I think it scores higher on this list than dedicated blunt implements, because it will be marginally more effective than a sword against people in armor because of the extra weight you have at the top, 
still you're not going to cut through metal armor however if you're facing someone with a gamberson for example or if you're facing someone with mail that maybe isn't the best quality you could still burst up some rings probably not cut through them but on the other hand if you were fighting a foe with absolutely no armor then the fact that you can easily open wounds with chopping motions and slicing motions even without needing too much force or to commit too much for an attack gives this weapon in my opinion an edge sorry for the pun against blunt weapons when you don't know if your opponent is going to be in full armor or not still the axe has the same problem of lack of hand protection and because of the fact that it's still a top heavy weapon it's not going to be as easy to defend with an axe than it would be with a sword. In terms of reach for an axe, well if it's a one-handed axe you're not going to have that much of a reach. Of course you could have a two-handed axe which will give you good reach but regardless of the reach advantage that you would have with a two-handed axe I would still prefer the weapon at number seven and that is because of its defensive capabilities which are superior to that of an axe whether it be one-handed or two-handed. At number seven we have the first sword of this list the falchion. Now, the falchion is a fascinating weapon. Um, it looks really intimidating. So the first thing we need to debunk out of the box is the fact that a falchion does not behave like an axe because real falchions were very sharp you would have distal taper in the blade. They are a little heavier, but they still have pretty good balance. They're not top heavy weapons when you have real medieval examples. They might be a little bit heavier than general arming swords, but not exceptionally heavy. Also, they were not anti-armor weapons. You can't use the broader end of a falchion to cut through metal armor. That's not what they were intended to. They were intended to chop through people. So they are very effective cutters given not particularly effective against an opponent in full armor, meaning full plate. But if it's an opponent with a with textile armor like Gamberson or someone without armor, I think the weapon could be very useful. It is more nimble than the weapons we have seen so far, but it also has hand protection. The fact that you can defend very effectively and a lot more effectively with this because of two reasons. It's more nimble and you've got hand guard protection scores him number seven. Now since I've mentioned the falchion I'd like to also mention the Langus Mesa which is a smaller version that did not make the list because it doesn't have a pommel and the falchion does. Okay that was a joke. It did not make the list because it's basically a smaller version of a falchion probably less warlike battlefield weapon than the Langus Mesa which is I think more for personal civilian personal protection but just wanted to mention it because it's a cool weapon. And number six we've got the arming sword. The arm Arming Sword scores number six because it's a weapon that is very well balanced. It has a double edge, whereas the Falchion only has a single edge. And that's, it's not necessarily a huge advantage, but I think I would be happy to have two edges instead of one if my life is at stake. You never know one of the two edges. Maybe I hit a piece of armor and it gets blunted. I can use the false edge. If that happens with a weapon that only has one edge, you know, I might be in trouble. Also, it's excellent at thrusting. So here you've got very good defense because of the hand protection. It is a very nimble and very well balanced sword even more balanced than the falchion and obviously more balanced than all the top heavy weapons that I mentioned so far but it also allows you to have a lot of choice in your offense department so you can't really thrust with a falchion you can't thrust with an axe and you can't really thrust with a mace now can you with a arming sword you can choose you can chop maybe not as effective as a falchion but you still can you can slice you can dice you can cut and you can thrust all of this makes it more versatile. So if you've got an opponent who's got a bit too much armor, more armor than you had anticipated, you can try half swording, good luck half swording with an axe or a falchion, and you can use a murder stroke if you really need to. So you've got more options with an arming sword. Now at number five, we've got the long sword. Longer than an arming sword, used two-handed. A long sword to me is always a better weapon than the arming sword if said arming sword is used by itself. Now if there was a shield involved then this list would have a different situation. I personally find arming sword plus shield an advantageous combination against a longsword for example but when you only have an arming sword or a longsword in my opinion the longsword is the best choice because it gives you extra reach. The fact that you can thrust your opponent when he can't reach you is not something that you should underestimate. You have two hands on the handle which means your leverage is better and given you can use an arming sword two-handed but it's not the 
the same leverage because you don't have as long as a handle. And in terms of defensive capability, there isn't too much difference between how nimble a longsword is as opposed to how nimble an arming sword is, because even though longsword tended to be slightly heavier than arming swords, you're using two hands anyways. So that might even allow you to be quicker. Now, if you were a very strong man, then feel free to substitute number five on this list to a greatsword, okay? But that is a weapon that even though they weren't real greatswords, they weren't as heavy as people think, they still are a handful to use. So for someone like me, medium, average strength, not strong, not extremely weak, I wouldn't want to use a greatsword in a duel for my life. I would rather use the nimbleness of the longsword. But if you're a very strong man, feel free to go for the greatsword. And number four, we have an interesting development of the longsword, which is the estoc, or the tuck, or stocco, if we want to use the Italian word for it. Let me show off my Italian a bit. This is a version of the longsword that is very much dedicated to thrusting. So you lose the ability, or most of your ability to cut. You can still cut a little bit, but not particularly efficiently in order to gain a stiffer sword that is a very good dedicated thruster. Now, for me, thrusts are more effective than cuts, generally speaking. Of course, very much in a duel and in a combat situation depends on what happens and how people behave and lots of variables and what sort of inklings they give you and the experience of this. So that it's not easy to just say thrusts are always better. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that generally speaking, a thrust is harder to defend from and I, and I personally prefer thrusts Overcuts. The reason why it's here, and number four on this list, and it's over all the other swords that we've seen, is because it maintains the defensibility of a longsword. It maintains the same nimbleness of the other weapons that we've seen because of the way it's balanced. But it's very good against both armored people because you can try and exploit the gaps in the armor with it. It's basically like you being able to half sword all the time without actually having to half sword because the blade is so stiff you don't need to make it stiffer by the way you grip it and if you half sword attack imagine that but at the same time thrusting a person without armor still can kill them so i think it's an excellent weapon and it is what will eventually lead to the development of the rapier which did not make the list simply because it's not technically a medieval weapon it's more of a renaissance weapon otherwise definitely i would have put a rapier here but the tuck already gives this idea the s stock gives you this idea of a dedicated thruster you can even use on horseback if you want some people did it was used in war it was used in hunting its speed and its maneuverability and its versatility means it should be a number four. If we are already in the top three. Of course, we've got pole weapons. Now, a number three, I'm putting the bill. The bill is a very interesting pole weapon because it has the ability to thrust like a spear, but you can also hook with it and it can help you to dismount opponents. It can help you to make them lose balance. You know, you can do a lot of things with a bill that really make it a very interesting multi-purpose weapon and you have got massive range because it's a pole weapon. And range is a probably one of the most important things in combat. Imagine if you have a person with a dagger going against a person with a bill. Goodbye. You know, nine, nine times out of ten, unless that one is Spider-Man, you know, the guy with the pole arm will win. However, since the predominant preference towards thrusting is very much of my own personal thing, I'll also mention here as an alternative the glaive, or the badish, if you wish. But let's talk about the glaive for now. A glaive is, again, a pole weapon, but it's mostly dedicated to cutting. You can thrust with it, but it's mostly a cutting pole weapon, similar to the Japanese naginata. So if you pref prefer in your own fighting style cutting over thrusting, consider the glaive a number three rather than the bill. But for me, I would choose a bill. Your ability to defend, of course, is the fact that you're far away. And imagine if you have space to maneuver and the person starts running towards you with their sword or whatever weapon they're using, mace, you just need to step back and keep thrusting. So fantastic. Let's move to number two. We've got the spear. Not necessarily a medieval weapon, of course. The spear is probably the first weapon of mankind. If, you know, pointy sticks is most likely what we use since the prehistorical times. So and since we are focused on the Middle Ages, I'm going to mention the pike. I'd like to also mention the partisan, although I think the pike is a better weapon, but the partisan is an interesting design. Obviously shorter than a pike, but it has these two little metal spikes from the sides that were supposed to deflect and deal with sword 
attacks. Still, I mentioned here for general interest, but the number two is the pike. And that is because pikes are huge. So imagine the range advantage you can have with a pike against an opponent who doesn't have it. You know what I just mentioned? In order to defend, you step back and keep thrusting like crazy. Now, of course, some pikes reach six meters. And I'm going to say if you're not trained or you're not particularly strong, I wouldn't go for a six meters pike. But, you know, three meters pike, four meters pike, absolutely fantastic weapon. It's basically a longer spear. So generally speaking, number two is spears, all sorts of spears, dedicated spears in all of their forms. Now, before going to number one, I have an honorable mention, and that is the lance. The lance is probably my favorite weapon, and it is an incredibly effective weapon. Then the lance is the one medieval weapon that can give you the most powerful hit out of all of these because he uses the power of the horse but the horse is the reason why it didn't really make this list because if you're not mounted you can't use it so since we said that highly specialized weapons don't make this list because again yes you choose the lance but you don't have a mount what are you gonna do i mean forget what the mmorpg terra tells you you can't use a full war lance just running towards people you need the mount and in this duel you don't have one so at number one we've got the polax now this to me is the most versatile and the best weapon both for offense and defense because first it's a pole arm so again massive range advantage but it also is extremely versatile because you can thrust with it you can cut with it and you can smash with it if your opponent is has no armor just thrust like crazy and if you do get the chance cut him as well if your opponent is in full armor then never mind just little twist of your wrist and you can start smashing him in a similar way that you would with a warhammer but from a safe distance wonderful of course in this area depending on your personal preference you could also put a halberd if you wish it's just me i prefer the polax i think it is weapon number one of this list. To finish off this video, I'd like to say why I didn't mention the Scottish broadsword, why I didn't mention the Italian schiavona, why I didn't mention the backsword or the saber, and that is because all of these weapons are mostly 16th century, 17th century, and onward weapons. And again, the video was focused on medieval weapons. But I'd like to say these names and show the pictures, because these are really cool weapons and very effective. For today, these are the top 10 most effective medieval weapons for a life-to-death duel. Please let me know in the comments below what you think of this list, if you agree, if you don't, what would be your choice of weapon if you were in this duel and you had to fight against Matt Easton. But let me know in the comments below. Thank you very much for watching and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.